absolutely needed. Good afternoon. Uh, my name is Johannes Lerchler from PNNL and TU Munich. I'm chairing this session together with Prof Professor Matteo Maestri from Politecnico Milano. It's our pleasure to uh, introduce and announce our first speaker, the keynote lecture given by Professor Gabor Somorjai on integration of selective heterogeneous, homogeneous, and enzyme catalysis on nanoscale. The lecture is going to be 35 minutes. There's going to be five minutes, if possible, for discussion to prepare the questions. Thank you. Thank you very much, Johannes. Uh, uh, catalysis is undergoing several revolutions over the last couple of decades, but I think what we have now is the most important, in my opinion. Uh, the field became firmly embedded in nanomaterials, cat catalyst by nanomaterials. It uh, didn't uh, uh, go away from solid state chemistry, didn't go away from chemical engineering, but it uh, embedded into an understanding on the atomic and molecular level. As a result, uh, we can do many things to look for the future. We can understand real working catalysts um, better and better on an atomic and molecular level, and that uh, gives us a few interesting inroads for, of the future. And this is one of them. The uh, integration on a molecular and atomic scale of three fields of catalysis, heterogeneous, homogeneous, and enzyme, and I'd like to make a case for this. They are all working in different media. Obviously, uh, heterogeneous, homogeneous catalysis work usually in organic liquids. Um, enzyme catalysis is almost always in water. Um, uh, and, of course, uh, uh, the, uh, the liquid interface um, and, and uh, heterogeneous catalysis can do both. Uh, 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 either a solid gas interface or solid liquid interface. Now, uh, this is a prototype example. Um, I'm sorry I have to sit here. I'm wedded to this because apparently this is the only way that amplifies. Amplify. Johannes, don't worry about it. I'll, I'll, I'll stay here. No, no, you can come down if you want. <laughs> But you should not have close, close to each other. Yeah, the, the problem is, is that, that I either turn right or left. You should forgive me if I do one more than the other. I'm right-handed. So, uh, uh, so the catalysts are, uh, are, are these. Uh, the uh, cytochrome is... Uh, uh, Four nanometers, including the protein wrap around the active site. The homogeneous cat catalyst are uh, 1.6 nanometers. This is the uh, polymerization of, of uh, propylene cat uh, catalysts um, uh, of, of this magnitude, uh, like most other homogeneous catalysts. And the heterogeneous catalysis is usually between 1 and 10 nanometers. The one, 10 nanometers. And, and not because we don't want to go lower uh, in, in size, but we have a hard time to get there. Okay. So uh, the whole technology, for many reasons, and the major reason is the transistor, is moving from uh, uh, micrometers to down to nanometers. But the, the catalysts are still much smaller than the smallest nano, uh, the transistor. My, I have many students at Intel. Um, they're telling me that the uh, state of the art in transistor science is about 24 nanometers. And according to Moore's law, it gets smaller and smaller. But uh, when you go to 10 nanometer, one nanometer, as you will see, uh, everything changes. The electronic structure of the materials changes, and the chemistry changes as a result of that. So uh, we focus uh, mostly on energy 
conversion, chemical energy conversion, and uh, this scale shows uh, how important this is, and uh, uh, I just want to focus on uh, the taking C6 molecules uh, with virtually zero octane number and make isomers, and the octone, octane number goes up with the isomers. If you want to translate that to diesel, uh, you can take a, a molecule like C16, C16 and do the same thing and do isomerization uh, as well, but that changes the cetane number uh, very uh, much. So what I'd like to focus on is how we get to a molecular understanding, as I see it, in the area of catalysis. And uh, th this is the outline of the talk. Uh, uh, the low coordination sites, which are key to catalysis, the, um, uh, the covalent mo molecular bonds of metals, and uh, nanoparticles uh, as well, and mesoporous oxides, uh, which uh, we can make uh, along with the metal nanoparticles. The instruments that we developed to do the molecular, um, molecular science of of the dynamics of catalysis. Catalysis is dynamics. And the fact that we, uh, in the past, with prenatal studies of catalysts and post-mortem studies of catalysts, uh, was deadly because it did not show us the dynamics that, that happens under catalytic conditions on a molecular scale. And then the in addition to covalent bond, the oxide metal interfaces introduce charges and acid-base catalysis. And these two chemi chemistry uh, of uh, covalent bonds and acid-base charge catalysis are the foundation uh, on which we build catalysis. Um, we do model reaction and turnover rates and selectivities, and that allows us now to heterogeneous, homogeneous cat catalysis, and the catalytic architecture which involves the enzyme I'm just learning about. And I will tell you how little that we know, but in fact, uh, clearly in selectivity second to none is the enzyme catalysis. Now, let's go to metal nanoparticles and mesoporous oxides. Uh, we use model systems. It, it started with single crystals, and one of the major uh, uh, triumphs to find out that the uh, ordered single crystals do virtually no catalytic chemistry. And so that uh, made us go, uh, as I show, to defects. Um, uh, then we go to nanoparticles, and whether you make it by electron beam lithography or photolithography, this is a very nice science and technology. Then you go to three dimensions, which means you increase the surface area, which is very important for <laughs> covalent catalysis, but not for acid-based catalysis. Acid-based catalysis depends on charges, and is uh, virtually um, uh, independent of surface area. And so you can go nanorods, etc. And so these were the model systems. Now the first major finding was in the 1970s is that when you put in defects, steps, and kinks, uh, then you can start uh, breaking strong chemical bond, like uh, CH bond, HH bond, OO bonds, etc., which you would not break on platinum, in this case, um, on the uh, highly ordered 111 phase, uh, uh, and even the 10 phase is not that good. So that immediately uh, made us focus on defects, but with the size, uh, with, with the onset of nanomaterials, obviously the size dependent introduces the defect concentration changes, and that turned out to be one of the key to selectivity of catalytic conversion. So the way we make these particles is using colloid chemistry almost exclusively now, uh, which allows you to uh, do colloid chemistry with a salt, uh, reduce it, and uh, uh, make nanoparticles 
um, and um, of any size. And this was a very interesting study um, to, to see how important nanoparticle dispersion is. And you can make nanoparticles with a very good size control. Uh, this is 1.5 plus minus 0.3, etc. And this is what we can do in the laboratory in 2012. But in uh, Uh, there was a good study uh, with the Buddha group in, at Stanford uh, showing very broad distribution of particles from incipient wetness, oxidation reduction, and it, it concluded that the, the most catalytic reactions are not structure sensitive. It doesn't matter what the particle size uh, in this distribution is, uh, except maybe ammonia synthesis. That was uh, very visibly structure sensitive. So uh, what we find with this uh, product distribution, and uh, uh, my postdoc who is now a great industrial scientist, uh, Pushkarev, uh, found that as you change the particle size, you can change the the test reactions, which are used for most oil companies, benzene hydrogenation or toluene hydrogenation, changes by a factor of four. And this is, you know, means $100 million a day for making high-octane gasoline. But in, in fact, the, the size dependence of the turnover rates were crucial. Now, uh, uh, when you change the size, of course, uh, this, uh, the top shows the size dependence of the same shape. Uh, you can also change the shape, and both of them are catalytically very significant. Now, uh, so now we go to nanoparticles because it's obvious that it changes the turnover rates and the selectivities, uh, sometimes one more than the other. Um, and so you can do it in two dimensions with the langmuir blodgett uh, uh, formation of nanoparticles in various concentration or by sonication or other ways you put it in, into a mesoporous materials and you go to three dimensional. Now, uh, what is very interesting and very well known now is that by hard templating, uh, as opposed to soft templating, you can take a, a mesoporous silica like SBA15 or MCF17 and coat it with a transition metal salt uh, and you oxidize this and then you leach out the, uh, the, the, uh, the, uh, the uh, silica um, uh, from that and you left behind with a mesoporous material of the transition metal oxides and then you can disperse the metal in, inside that. So you can make mesoporous supports of various oxides and uh, put metal nanoparticles inside with the same dispersion that you desire. Now, um, the um, uh, other way of making a very interesting structures is the core shell structures, where you have a metal uh, core and then you put a silica shell, which is mesoporous in there. And uh, uh, these structures are very important if you want to do high temperature catalysis. Uh, the, the metals of the size that you desire, sometimes, uh, you know, five nanometer or three nanometer size, have a much lower melting point than the bulk materials. So if you go to high temperatures, uh, platinum or gold or any transition metal melts at the lower temperature than uh, the, the uh, single crystal, okay? Uh, hundreds of degrees lower. And so when you want to do combustion chemistry, this is a problem. However, if you have a, a silica, mesoporous silica coating or alumina coating, then you, what you find is that you can go to 900 centigrade before these particles melt. It's still not the bulk melting point, but in fact, you can do combustion catalysis around the, uh, 900 centigrade or so. Now, uh, let's just talk, no acid base, just look at metal nanoparticles covalent bond catalysis. And this is the, 
the, the final uh, uh, conclusion. The size and shape controls both catalytic reaction rates and selectivities. And the way we study that is uh, study some simple reactions which uh, have multiple products. For example, look at crotonaldehyde. Crotonaldehyde here has two double bonds, uh, CO and CC double bond. You hydrogenate, you either get crotyl alcohol, partial hydrogenation, or butyraldehyde. And then you could go on for, to full hydrogenation of butanol or, or butane. So uh, all these other reactions, pyrrole hydrogenation, furan hydrogenation, give you several products, and you see how the selectivity depends on the size and shape. And so what you find is that as you change the size, the, this is benzene cyclohexene hydrogenation to dehydrogenation selectivity. Uh, you make a benzene at high sizes, and you make, uh, hyd uh, uh, make uh, hyd hydrogenation at high sizes, and uh, you make benzene at, 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 uh, at smaller s um, uh, I'm sorry. Uh, you make benzene here, um, which is a small particles like to dehydrogenate. The big particles uh, like to uh, uh, hydrogenate. Um, if you take uh, uh, furan, you see partial hydrogenation, and as you change the size and the crystallography, you change the product distribution from one product majority to another product majority. Um, uh, this was uh, uh, decarbonylation of furfural, which is a, a product of, of uh, partial biomass conversion, and you find that in uh, a small uh, furfural, uh, this one is in making mostly furan, and it's a decarbonylation uh, uh, mechanism. And when you go to big particles, you get hydrogenation to furfuryl alcohol. And so uh, uh, let me give you one shape-dependent catalysis. And this is methyl cyclopentane. Metal cyclopentane can isomerize in all these isomers. It turns out that when you change the shape, the, uh, the, uh, the isomer you get is shape dependent. Okay? A very interesting case, uh, the uh, turnover rate doesn't change much, but uh, the product selectivity changes dramatically. Now, um, the question is why? Why is selectivity and turnover rates uh, size and shape sensitive. Um, to this, this is, I think, the, the fatal fault of catalysis, is that most of the studies were not done under reaction conditions when you see the dynamics, but you look and get the, either the reactant or the product, then you conclude the, what is in between. I mean, if you look at the fetus and the dead body, you, you can see how much less that you can learn by looking at uh, life itself. <laughs> now, the atomic level characterization is under reaction condition. And I spent about 20 years to develop these techniques that can uh, look at the reaction on, uh, you look at the uh, chemical catalytic reaction under uh, catalytic reaction conditions. And the techniques, um, it seems, gain tremendous uh, footing in uh, uh, synchrotron, synchrotron radiation. And while the sun frequency generation at the top was, was a Berkeley development um, by Ron Shen and myself uh, to do vibrational spectroscopy under high pressure or solid liquid interface conditions on the interface, the other synchrotron techniques gave us uh, uh, oxidation states, uh, 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 coordination numbers, um, and uh, microspectroscopy at uh, the solid liquid interface, um, all of them under dynamic reaction conditions. Uh, the high pressure scanning tunneling microscopy was one of these techniques, but it has problems. We cannot image nanoparticles with STM, but we can uh, image single crystals. And so uh, that, that's a major drawback. 
and the nanodiodes uh, will get to. So uh, the, the sun frequency generation, which is two laser beams, one of them infrared, the other one visible, you keep the visible frequency constant and you, f uh, and, and you get, uh, you, you tune the infrared frequency. And this has both Raman and dipole selection rules. And the bottom line is, if you have a central symmetric environment, either a central symmetric solid or a gas or a liquid, this signal, the sound frequency signal, is zero. However, at the surface, it's non-zero because non-central symmetricity of the surface makes this sound frequency vibrational spectra uh, alive, alive. And so, as a result, you can see reaction intermediates. Um, if you look at ethylene hydrogenation, you can see three species on the surface. One is the one that turns over. These two are spectators, okay? But you need isotope studies, etc., to distinguish. You see all three with vibration spectroscopy. If you do cyclones in hydrogenation, you see uh, 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 the, the cyclohexadienes, one three and one four cyclohexadienes, and, uh, and also these allyl reactions. The, bottom line is we almost never see the product or the reactant, but we see something in between. But this is not exclusive. Uh, we have to do more to, to make this more conclusive. So the other one is high pressure XPS. You can you, you perhaps all know what is X, the photo electron spectroscopy gives us. It's inner shell electron excitation to give you oxidation states. But you can do it in the presence of uh, 10 tor. Now, 10 tor of uh, molecular beams, uh, and the X-rays go through, and the photoelectrons go through these 10 tor of one millimeter molecular beams, and give you the uh, oxidation state of the surface uh, as a function of size and gases. Now, this is uh, you know bimetallic. And so it's, it's, it's 16 nanometer in size and 50-50 composition, but the surface is rhodium. The, uh, the bulk is, is palladium. Now, when you change the gas composition uh, to oxidizing, uh, the rhodium stays on the surface and the palladium stays on the bulk. But when you go to reducing conditions, CO or uh, or some other reducing gas or molecule, um, you get 50-50 on the surface. If you go oxidizing again, again rhodium segregates. So in fact, the reason why bimetallics are so important in covalent chemistry, because they are a broad picture of what you can do with them, going from reducing to oxidizing uh, environments. So there are lots of, if you look at the literature, there are about 75 bimetallics, all of them used as catalysts. And they are very popular for this reason, that you, you broaden the spectrum of chemistry you can do. Now, um, so uh, this is the bottom line. The bimetallics particles change surface composition but then you change the chemical environment. The STM has uh, lots of benefits and lots of drawbacks. Uh, this is how you can see on an atomic scale mobilities on the surface. If you do cyclohexene hydrogenation, dehydrogenation, you see absolutely nothing because the molecules that are on the surface that is covered with cyclohexene and the products um, move so rapidly, the scanning speed of this is 100 angstrom per millisecond. That scanning speed is very slow compared to the motion of the molecules, and so it's blurred. However, if you poison the surface with CO, you get beautiful order structures because the CO doesn't allow that mobility and there is no catalytic chemistry. So catalytic chemistry is associated with, with mobility of the adsorbate. And uh, you poison, uh, you have a nice ordered structure and no catalytic chemistry. Now, uh, in fact, not only 
the, the adsorbed molecules move, but the metal moves underneath. And you can take it, you can take a step surface with 1 1 1 steps and um, uh, try to um, adsorb carbon monoxide. What you find the steps here break up to uh, uh, these clusters, clusters here, and uh, uh, because the uh, CO metal bond um, competes with the um, with, with the metal-metal bonds. So the metal restructures to accommodate more CO. The interesting thing is that when you pump out this CO gas, um, you, you get back to the, uh, uh, to the adsorbate. Um, uh, on, on, uh, uh, you get back to the original structure. Uh, when you, uh, this is the cluster structure. You pump out the gas, you go back to the original structure. So this is something that is pressure dependent. And I see Frank here who did much of this work, um, uh, who is at Kansas. And um, uh, uh, it gives you a clue to why high pressure studies, at least in the 1920s and 1930s, were the first way of getting a good catalytic conversion of something like methanol synthesis or with CO and hydrogen or, or ammonia synthesis. But then later on, uh, the catalyst improved to go to lower pressures. So now let's go to acid-base catalysis, which is equally or sometimes maybe more important than covalent catalysis. The genesis. Uh, of the science, uh, in my lab at least, was the oxide metal interfaces that were responsible for the charges generated that did the surface catalytic chemistry. So now this is something that um, uh, my friend uh, uh, Johan, uh, I'm sure you will appreciate. Uh, is that, uh, if you have a micro crystalline surface, like a zeolite, a, 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 a very small crystallite zeolite, and you put a metal on it um, between 1 and 10 nanometers, the metal cannot go into the uh, uh, microcrystalline oxide. It sits on, on the outside and it does chemistry. And these are called usually bifunctional catalysis because the metal catalytic side and the, the oxide side are in different location. It's truly bifunctional. However, if you go to mesoporous oxides, you can make the mesopore bigger than the metal size. And then you can, I am wedded to mesoporous materials for these reasons. You can go and put the metal together with the oxide and then it suddenly turns into a single side catalysis. And this cat catalytic change is totally different and there are benefits of each probably, but I see the benefits of this much more for selectivity. So let's see, let me give you an example. If you take a, a, a mesoporous material like MCF17, which has a pore size of 25 nanometer, um, uh, you easily put platinum in there, which is a five nanometer platinum. And so let's see what is the catalytic uh, effect of this. When you have the metal alone, you see nothing. And this is n-hexene isomerization. When you have the, uh, the oxide alone, you see nothing, but if you put together the mesoporous oxide, which is MCF17, which is uh, uh, acidified weak acid uh, with aluminum chloride, you get 100% isomer selectivity. So when you go from just the metal, just the oxide, a virtually no good chemistry. But if you put the two together in a single site mode, you get tremendous selectivity. And this is a major effect for using as mesoporous oxides because you get this sort of chemistry, uh, very, very selective. I'll give you another example. 
uh, as I told you, you can make mesoporous oxides by hard templating. Now, if you take uh, niobium oxide and tantalum oxide, um, the, uh, in, in these cases, all you get for n-hexane is cracking. This is, uh, this is cracking. Um, now, if you put the metal in with the mesoporous niobium oxide, tantalum oxide, you get almost 100% isomerization. And the isomerization grows as soon as you go to a single site oxide metal combination. This is the, probably the most interesting results of these acid base catalysis. If you do CO oxidation, the CO oxidation on platinum and silica is, uh, uh, let's see, what is that, 1.25. Am I right? Uh, uh, no, 0 0.05, 0 0.05. And the uh, cobalt oxide, ni ni uh, nickel oxide, th these are negligible CO oxidation catalysts. If you put platinum inside the mesopores, look at this one, this one, right there, this one. It's a 7,000 forward increase of CO oxidation. This is not a linear increase but it is a totally different chemistry if you have the oxide metal together compared to just having the oxide alone or the platinum and silica, okay? Now, uh, in the meantime, of course, the oxidation state of, of the transition metal ion changes, but the change is small. Uh, the, this has an enormous effect, and we still hope to understand this, but it all the genesis of this is the oxide metal interface chemistry. And this, is, uh, this has a long history, uh, both in technology, uh, Exxon had a lot of work in, in this field, um, and also going back to uh, Munich, um, uh, this was the, uh, uh, the, the old catalyst of uh, uh, Schwab. Uh, Schwab. Um, who did this for several PhD theses. He put a uh, metal in there and he gets CO oxidation or H2O2 reactions uh, at some uh, turnover, but if you cover it with an oxide, uh, which alone doesn't do anything, uh, he gets a look at that, the oxide doesn't do anything, he, he has a, an order of magnitude increase because of the oxide metal interface. So this was the first type of study of the oxide metal SMSI catalysis. Now, of course, we can do now um, a sophisticated study with, with vibrational spectroscopy. This is the, the platinum silica system for crotonaldehyde and a platinum titanium system with crotonaldehyde. And the turnover rates and the product distributions are totally different by having the right oxide, even though the oxide doesn't do anything by, by itself. And so uh, uh, this is the vibration spectrum, which implicates the, the chemistry at the, at the titanium oxide in addition to the platinum on, on uh, chemistry of crotonaldehyde and the combination that uh, ap ap gives a, uh, a, 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 a total different product distribution in this reaction. Now, uh, we studied that uh, to, con to, to conclude that uh, the, the Schwab was right, and it's in a very important area. This is rhodium alone making CO hydrogenation, and this is with different oxides. And the oxides, depending on their band gap, uh, gives uh, much higher uh, turnover rates by 14 times or 15 times as high in with the right band gap, medium-sized band gap, but with high band gaps or low band gaps, uh, there is uh, m very little effect. So, about 25 years ago, mostly from the United States and Germany, the uh, field of hot electron chemistry started. Um, uh, it started with shining photons on metals, and, and uh, the photons uh, excite the uh, free electrons, the valence electrons, and um, to high kinetic energy, and as a result, they can diffuse 
and diffuse in a certain uh, uh, mean free path. And the mean free path is about 5 to 10 nanometers or so. It is precisely the size of the nanoparticles of the oxides. So the hot electrons can make it from where you're generating to the oxide metal interface and spill over at the Schottky barrier. And so this one uh, started to uh, develop the science of hot electron chemistry. Uh, and uh, uh, this is a typical Schottky barrier device that we made in Berkeley, a battery, where you have a platinum, which has, uh, can be uh, no, no more than five nanometer thickness. Uh, you, you do CO oxidation or H2O2 reactions, which are both exothermic reactions, and the photoelectrons go to the interface, and in fact, uh, the electrons go uh, to, uh, from the metal uh, to the oxide, and then back to the uh, other side of the oxide, it's a battery, okay? And when you do this, uh, you find that the, the uh, uh, turnover rate of CO oxidation and the current that you measure is correlated. So clearly the hot electron is generating the, 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 the charge that is uh, involved in the transition state in this carbon monoxide chemistry, which is my good friend uh, who does theory tells me that it's CO2 minus, which is a low-lying electronic state. Uh, the same thing is true for H2O2, where the chemical current is, uh, is correlated with the turnover rate, which is in red, and again the, uh, the uh, uh, transition state appears to be H2O minus, which is a low electronic state. Okay, so uh, the important thing is that in the acid-base catalysis, the uh, it's correlated with the charge concentration and independent of the surface area, unlike the covalent catalysis. And so I have some good colleagues who are interested in what we call tandem catalysis. When you make a sandwich of oxide, metal, platinum, um, and uh, silica interface, and you put methanol in there, and, um, uh, and ethylene, you find propon, uh, pr uh, propylene, um, pr uh, propanol, and not ethylene hydrogenation, because this chemistry, the two chemistries are uh, uh, combined in this tandem catalysis with the two interface uh, charge distributions. Uh, what is interesting is that I see one electron for every 10,000 turnover amplification of doing this uh, hot electron chemistry. I don't understand that, but uh, obviously there is a tremendous amplification even though I probably lose uh, 100, uh, you know, 100 times as many electrons than molecules, but it is still an enormous, uh, it looks like a combustion reaction, and, and that has to be understood. Um, this is a, a very good study in uh, John Park in, in Korea, at KAIST, where he takes a, 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 a semiconductor and then puts platinum at the, uh, we call it uh, nanodumbbells, platinum at the end of this rod, and then uh, he gets a beautiful uh, acid-base catalysis, but then he shines light, and the light further amplifies the chemistry. So a combination of photochemistry and this acid-base um, interface catalysis could be a very interesting way to go. So now finally the oxidation state changes in nanoparticles. This was a discovery of changing the nanoparticle sizes. When we went with rhodium, this is rhodium chemistry for CO oxidation, when we went to about 1.5 nanometer size, suddenly the CO oxidation rate went up 30-fold. And so when you look at the photoelectron spectrum, you find that instead of rhodium now, with the small sizes, you have rhodium 3 plus. And if you do that the same with platinum, when you go to below one nanometer, 
for gold, and I'd like to remind you of, of gold chemistry with small nanoparticles, uh, the platinum 4 plus to 0 ratio is uh, here 0.16 with large particles, 1.5 nanometer platinum, but when you go to 0.8 nanometer platinum, which is 30 atoms, 30 atoms, no bulk atoms, no, uh, you get uh, opposite, you get a mostly oxidized state uh, as compared to metallic state in this case by photoelectron spectroscopy. And Norskov had a very nice theory, which he showed that when you change the size of gold, in this case, uh, you go to about uh, 0.8 or 1 nanometer, which is 40 atoms, uh, the gold, uh, the oxygen adsorption sucks out electrons from around the adsorption site, but when you go to a very small uh, nanoparticle, it sucks out the electrons from the whole nanoparticle. And so what you have is suddenly a change of electronic structure. And so when you went to go to one nanometer in size, there are no bulk atoms, just surface atoms. And that changes the electronic structure. And it, it appears that uh, that allowed us to try to do homogeneous catalysis with these small nanoparticles. And I have colleagues who do homogeneous catalysis, and so we took a dendromer and put platinum on it, and uh, then we went to about 0.8 or 1, uh, 40 atoms. It says 40 atoms in there um, is, um, is one nanometer, one nanometer. You can do homogeneous catalysis with these very small particles, uh, you know, this is the credibility slides. You get homogeneous catalysis with all these 40 atom size metals, including um, uh, in, in, including rhodium, um, palladium, gold, etc. When you look at it with the synchrotron, what you see is you can look at the oxidation state and the coordination number. You always have to put an oxidizing uh, in the solution. You can see that under oxidizing condition, the rhodium nanoparticle breaks up to small clusters. Under reducing conditions, it, re it reassembles into the larger, uh, larger clusters. And it shows in the oxidation state and the coordination number. So why not do hybrid catalysis, uh, which is not done? Uh, homogeneous heterogeneous, you can heterogenize homogeneous catalyst. Uh, that opens up all sorts of things. Homogeneous catalysis is gentle. These are isomerization, ligand changes, uh, making, uh, breaking CH bonds, CO bonds, that we can routinely do in heterogeneous catalysis does not exist in homogeneous catalysis. So maybe with these catalysts we can do both. Then the enzymes coming in, and I'm just learning, I'd like to learn.